Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Thamburri. This month we have with us Donna Chirico, professor of psychology from your college and also resident faculty at the John D. Calander Italian American Institute. We're going to chat about things dealing with the Italian American community in general and also Italian American studies and what's going on perhaps university wide. So welcome to Italics Thank once you. more. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here to talk about these important matters that don't always seem to concern everybody. Well, we're going to make sure that they concern people, I think, after this. Let's start with a general theme and that is the responsibilities of ethnic associations, in our case, Italian-American associations vis-a-vis Italian-Americans and their, well, I'm going to use a word here that some people are going to shudder about, their positionality mm -hmm. within the U.S. fabric, right? Right. Do they even have any responsibilities? Can they just do whatever they want? I mean, how do we deal with that? Well, I think that the matter of positionality is actually a very serious issue both outside of academe and inside of academe in particular, in our cases. All ethnic groups create their own organizations. And the problem that emerges is that even when different ethnic groups share the same goals, be they social, political, whatever they are, they don't interact with each other. So therefore, you could have this greater force if, if these organizations would come together. And then ironically, within the Italian-American community, there's probably even more disagreement <laughs> among some of those organizations who don't seem to understand that they need to coalesce around the issues that are most critical for their community. And they, again, independently, they speak about these issues, but an outsider sees dozens of organizations talking about the same thing without any one clear message, or even if not one clear message, at least a shared mission of some kind that they could reach out to. So, so that's a problem. And then, of course, inside the academy, I think the uh, problems in some ways are deeper because of the nature of immigration and how mm -hmm. it's worked there's a presumption that all, quote, white Europeans are the same. So therefore, even though some groups may share similarities, for example, people always talk about the Irish and the Italians because they're, the majority of the communities are Catholic. But those two communities practice Catholicism very differently and with a very different chain of command and hierarchy. So when anything has to get done, we don't get the proper research we need because those, those, all those immigrants are put into the aggregate. So we don't understand the nuances and the specific needs and concerns. So one thing we need in the academy is people who do, not just do ethnic studies broadly, but are willing to really go in and look at the individual groups, every group, including Italian Americans. There seems to be this notion that there needs to be a uh, hundred percent quote unquote unity, whatever that means, right? And I mean, for the most part, we can't even agree on whether the coffee's good, let alone. Just, uh, is, <laughs> it, is it sauce or gravy? We can't, and we can't it's decide these gravy, things, exactly. right? So, so what do we do with, let's say, a good eight to 10 major Italian American organizations, right? And they have a similar general overall mission of the pr uh, promotion of Italian, heritage and so many of them language and so on and so forth. But there seems to be disagreement on some things. And unfortunately, there seem to be, in some cases, litmus tests. Oh, well, that's why, I mean, I just mentioned religion yeah. as an example. There are many people out in the world who presume that all Italians are Catholic. One can understand that because of the nature of the festas and, you know, in the summertime, you can't walk any place in New York City without having an Italian festival to a saint. So, but it is also the case that some of the leaders of those organizations have used that as a litmus test to say, oh, well, you have to be Catholic, not understanding that only about two thirds of Americans of Italian heritage are Catholic. And then within that, People practice, people don't practice. There are different ways of expressing. So this idea that my organization has the right idea is the wrong one that they have to lose, right? It, yeah. I mean, there are so many internal differences. And we're seeing those differences more sharply with the very place we should be engaging, which is younger people. 
because the reality is most of those organizations are run by people who should have stepped down from those organizations <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> so how are we going to get young people involved if they see what is really a prejudice? Yeah. It's a bigotry to say, well, well, you should be Catholic if you're going to lead an organization. Well, that's, that's not the case. And for you know, many of the controversies we hear about currently, including Columbus, younger people don't even care about. And of course, it's also contingent on where are you in the United States. Right. This is an issue here in New York. We have, a, we have a big parade that's a major media attraction. Therefore, it gets more press here. But people who grow up elsewhere, it's not even an issue for them. You're right, the organizations are in and of themselves problematic. But even the mere assumption that many people who grow up in the metropolitan area have that the rest of the country is as ethnically and racially diverse. Yes. But there are places where you go, or even myself, you know, you're considered very different from who's there. And something that I, I hear this from students when they go on you know, trips related to school where they, they feel out of place. Right? So we forget that this mentality is a problematic one then for, for the people who have it and then more importantly for the organizations who promote that mentality. Let's talk a little bit about the um, necessity of a connection between these organizations and the academy. Why is that important? <sighs> <laughs> you said connection, but why is the disconnection so important? <laughs> There's always this tension between people who have um, lots of money but limited education and the reverse. There are many academics who don't trust those organizations. But you know, in, in my now long-term experience with the business side, the non-academic side, it's, it's very challenging to get these organizations to understand that the education piece is exceedingly important and it's a way to get a message across to the next generation to have things available for people to really come to understand if you're going to argue look if you're going to argue about Columbus you should have read something about it you should understand the circumstance that's true for whatever it is if you're going to say Italians are Catholic you should know the numbers you sh if you want to argue it then say okay well two-thirds are Catholic but you don't even know that the, the numbers but the, the part that has always troubled me is the mistrust on the other side. I'm a professor of psychology, so I, I always feel that there's a little bit of a, a sense of lack of ego here, right? You know, well, I don't have a doctorate, I don't have a master's degree, but so therefore you have to parlay being wealthy for your power rather than using knowledge as power, which is equally effective. Yeah. Right? I mean, just look at the way political campaigns are run today, where information is put out into the world. So being knowledgeable, being able to speak, being able to communicate, these are critical elements. But the other side assumes, well, it's, it's not as important as having the money. And of course, the academics need the money right? right? To, to pay for programs, scholarships, uh, faculty positions, chairs in various areas. So. There is a sense on the other side, oh, well, they just want our money, but, that, but we know that's not the case, yeah. right? You want participation. You want discussion of the issues together, not as if somehow, well, the discussion is up to the scholars, and that's not really for us. No, it's for everybody. Let's talk about the scholarships, because I think, mm -hmm. yeah. you, know, you know my feeling. My feeling is that give all the scholarships you want, but maybe we need to be a little bit judicious in what requirement we may or may not want. Mm -hmm. to add to, if not all, at least some of the scholarships, right? And it just seems to me that if you're going to give a significant amount of money to a college student and you're in a major Italian-American organization and your mission is to promote and uh, the, the heritage, the Italian language, uh, that you should probably ask something back in that regard. And that's where I think a semester or two of Italian might be. A requirement. Well, there's no question about it, especially since many of those, many of the leaders of those organizations would say they are giving the scholarships and at the same time they want to have young people learn about their culture and continue the traditions of the culture. So one way to continue the tradition would be for people to learn Italian. Right. 
learn Italian history, learn origins. We, we were talking about film, right? I mean, watch some Italian films, see what, how the world is portrayed in one, mm -hmm. in Italy versus here. Right? It's, it's, there's some horrific portrayals of Italy <laughs> done here in the United States, yeah. as well as Italian Americans. Mm -hmm. So to see, as you said, see things that raise what we would call your cognitive dissonance about yeah. it, right? It's not all one monolith. There are yeah. different experiences. But there have to be, you're right, there have to be what I would call dedicated scholarships. And as I said before, if there are eight to 10 major Italian-American organizations for the promotion of Italian heritage and culture. We could have five to eight to nine dissertation fellowships on an annual basis, which of course means that people are, people are going to be getting that research done, it, that information is going to get out there. And those who, who, who normally wouldn't read would read it then because it would be part of their organization. But you're right, you know, the books are important because some people are doing work in areas that are fascinating to the general public. Right. So therefore, it gets out into the, the bookstores, it gets on Amazon. If people are searching for a topic, the book comes up, they buy the book. Yeah. They don't understand the extent you, that you can Im, influence people about what they think about the Italian American community. Yeah. Right? It's, it's just seen as, you know, research yeah. they can't understand. Yeah. A recent novel by Anthony Mara, who happens to be of Italian heritage, his novel, uh, Mercury Pictures Presents, is about Italy and the United States before the war. It's fascinating. You know, when you talk about how your family came or what, your, what affected your family, here's a way to learn about it in a way that is not simply reading a dry paper, right? as they might say, we find yeah. them fascinating. <laughs> but it's to support people who are writers, scholars, poets, and it yeah. doesn't happen the way it should. But also one of the two results of uh, the uh, Copo Miao Dissertation Fellowship, it was called the Carlo Bellini Dissertation Fellowship because Carlo Bellini was the first professor of yeah. Italian in the United States, is Jessica Jackson's book yes. on Italian Americans in the Jim Crow era. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's that one, one episode in the book she recounts about an African-American being uh, charged and found guilty of miscegenation because he, quote unquote, lived with, it, co-inhabited with a white woman. And then the, the defense was, well, but she's Sicilian. <laughs> but it's important. It's important oh, yes. to know how Italians and specifically how Sicilians were perceived in 1922 in Alabama. That was mm -hmm. the place that took place in Alabama. We have this idea that it, Italian Americans are mostly here in the Northeast, and we know there are fairly large communities in many places, and they have a different kind of history based on things like Jim Crow, based on other aspects of the local community that were not true here, right? Mm -hmm. Here, there's always been a greater interplay among racial groups, ethnic groups, which you do not see in places in the South still. Right. So therefore, the experience becomes different. They're fascinating to learn about. And then you, you know, I always laugh when um, you're at an, a meeting and there are people there from these organizations and someone always says, well, my family all came legally. <laughs> And I want to say, can you prove that? <laughs> because we have this notion, oh, well, all the European immigrants came legally. I'm like, right. really? Go to, go to the Bronx and to the communities there yeah. where there are still Europeans who are not legal. Let's talk about something else that I guess we can categorize it all under the general rubric of humor. <laughs> I have a series of questions, right? Mm -hmm. One, should we distinguish between that sort of spicy, saucy humor? Should, it, should, should we articulate it only privately within the tribe or, or is it okay to do it publicly, right, number one? And is everything on the table? Mm. Yeah. I mean, this is something that um, has been studied widely in psychology, certainly. I mean, Freud wrote about it, right? And Freud made a distinction between humor that was really meant to denigrate a person right. and then the kind of humor that's based on puns and, and other language that was not. So now the part where you would denigrate a person, we now call those microaggressions. Mm -hmm. But they're insidious. To give an example, and I won't name the campus, 
a diversity, equity, and inclusion conference was workshop was held on a campus, and a person who was at the this workshop talked about Italian Americans being a uh, an affirmative action group at City University. To which an another faculty member on that person's campus said, "Ho, oh, what line from the mafia did you have to use to get that categorization?" Now, why was the colleague upset and told me the story? Because nobody in the room said anything. Right? Because this is a legitimate issue at CUNY. Right? So even the people running the workshop didn't say anything. I right? say, well, that's not the kind of comment you would make, or why would you assume it's illegitimate? So we often couch very serious negative issues in humor. I have no doubt that the person who said it absolutely thought that somehow that the, the community had been pressured into creating that category. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's a fine line, but it, it is one that we see replicated in movies and advertising by Italian Americans. Right? There are many, many a bad television show, many a bad mm -hmm. movie. A couple of recent movies that have just come out or are coming out, which perpetuate yes. that we're all a bunch of, you know, idiots. We, you know, we... We eat all the time. I mean, it's like, yeah, these things are all true. And as we know, stereotypes often become traditions, and we like the good ones. But to the rest of the world, that's what they see, a bunch of buffoons sitting around a table. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's, it's important to understand that it has to be counteracted, at least in some way. Yeah. I have two, uh, two uh, incidences in mind. One, of course, is the name of a restaurant in Kansas called Terroni. Now, for people who are familiar with Italian, you know that Terroni is basically the N-word for Southern Italian, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, these people opened up a restaurant and they called it Terroni. Right? And then the other thing, of course, I have in mind is the person who has, and we see this in English, of course, but who goes around with an expression that basically tells you where to go, what to do, and how to do it, mm -hmm. right? I'm using a euphemism here. Right. What do we do with those? It's an important point because I think you have to divide it up a little bit more. The average, you know, guy who's walking around Little Italy in the Bronx, you know, he wants to buy a t-shirt, he wants to support his friend. I have a little more patience for that. But I've seen leaders of major organizations that support Italian American issues wearing such things. Right? And there I have a problem. <laughs> So you're trying to communicate that, uh, you know, we are an upstanding member of the community, that we have a lot to offer, and here you are, and you're, you're putting forward these messages, in part because you don't speak Italian, you don't know what terone means, right? You don't no, understand. No, the strength of that. Word. Right, you don't right. understand the power of it, because nobody's right. saying it in front of you when you go on your nice, you know, tour to, right. to Sicily. So to me, that, that's, this is actually a very important point because you throw these things around and they perpetuate these, not just stereotypes, every community has stereotypes, but you perpetuate a negative feeling toward a group that somehow they're not worthy enough, smart enough, educated enough to move to the next levels of leadership in not just business, but other places. Right? So it, it becomes a, a very important point about, th about this issue. Mm -hmm. Advertisements. You know, I did something a few years ago about, you know, showing the advertisements going back to the 20s and how, you know, until the present, it's as if Italian Americans only care about these three things, right? And in, it's always a woman in the kitchen making the sauce or whatever. I mean, occasionally you, you throw somebody else in the mix, but the same messages are sent across that are not supportive messages to the next group that wants to come along and break away from that idea. You don't have to get married. You don't have to have children. These are choices you make. But if you're going to say to me, oh, you, when you're, once you're married, you know, you, you can't work, well, that's an absurd idea, but one that many ethnic groups, not just Italian Americans, still perpetuate. That's why I asked not only what's on the table, but whether what might be okay within the tribe and what might be okay publicly. You know, and um, and how then, and you just explain how it's read, you know, and then we've seen some major Italian organizations here do some advertisements, make some advertisements that just sort of, you know, 
make you go, hmm. hmm. <laughs> that clearly someone has not given that any thought, no. or is there someone who was Italian-American had nothing to do with that right. advertisement, right? right? And also the idea of differences within communities. I had once had a, a conversation with a, a colleague who's African-American who understands the differences in the black community very well, and that person was so surprised to hear that ethnic differences exist within the community. When these stereotypes are thrown around in advertisements or, or movies, movies have a huge impact, right? I mean, there's no argument. The Godfather had an enormous historical, intellectual impact and led to a series of other films that perpetuate the same yeah. <laughs> idea. So therefore, you, you cannot, as an Italian-American, live without someone asking if you're connected, right? Or people use the phrases from the movies, right? I mean, so... Or the major, tele the major telephone company in the late 70s, early 80s said, well, now we're all connected. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, so many people outside the Italian-American community think this is a great idea. Yeah. I mean, certainly young people within the Italian-American community, it's the whole Guido phenomenon where you want to dress a certain way, look a certain way, even speak a certain way, right? You know, you don't, you don't actually have to sound a particular way if you want to move up in certain ranks. And we, look, you can say, well, as, as I've had colleagues say, yes, but that's a, that's a regional accent, that's your ethnic accent, you should be allowed to use it. I said, yeah, you should be, but understand there are going to be places that won't allow you to move forward because of that. Right or wrong, they won't Right or wrong, they, they, just, they right. just won't. In the same way that once upon a time certain companies wouldn't hire certain ethnic groups or races to do certain yeah. things. And we see in, you know, in the civil service mentality of New York City, we see where the Irish are, where Italians are, where other groups are. And wh why did that happen? Because they couldn't get hired in another sector. And so it does have a huge impact. There's another issue, and I think this is part, another complication that's part of it. And, and sometimes there's that sense of, um, of being a trader not to your ethnic group, full stop, but to the level of class within your ethnic group, right? So if you're working class mm -hmm. Italian American, even though you've gone on and gotten your BA and your MA and your PhD or D whatever and your EDD and your this and that D and whatever, you hold on to certain behavioral patterns mm -hmm. that maybe in the end are not as productive. Right. It is, it's a, it's a very, that's a very important point, and as you said it, I could hear my father. <laughs> Anytime I would disagree with something or an argument would come up, who would say, oh, that degree in psychology. <laughs> but the whole idea of having a degree, right, is if, what, are you better than us? Right. And that exists in many <clears throat> ethnic communities, right? So you have a degree, so somehow that makes you better, makes you different. But of course, yeah, that, I am different because I went and got a degree. I don't want to go into the family business. And then, and then the upset when we see, for example, recently we've seen two major Italian-American stores close, you know, one in the village, one in the Bronx. And why? Because the parent made sure his kids went to college and now they don't want to run the sandwich shop. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that great irony too, right? I, I spent all this money for you to go to Fordham and now I want you to come back and run the shop? No. <laughs> So we see this as well, right? So yeah. that, and then you see pieces being lost, and then, which is why the comment gets made, oh yeah, well as soon as they get an education, they leave. But that's not just for Italian Americans, that's the nature of American right. society, right? The whole point is to, to change, to expand yourself, and we have a much more, um, we have a community today around the world that's global. Right? You can move anywhere you want. If yeah. you need a job, if it's not here, you go someplace else, which now means you're not coming home for Sunday dinner. And they'll lament that. Or not even for Easter or Christmas. Oh, well, especially Easter. Or still. Especially, especially, Easter, especially Easter, right? right? Which is more of a religious holiday. More than, it, yeah. Right? Yeah. More than Christmas. where More solemn least, than Christmas. Exactly. Right, exactly. So that goes back to the idea of the scholarships, right? So in some sense, they're supporting the very thing they're against. So at least make them dedicated so you get something out of it. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone through a lot. We've gone over a lot. We've touched upon on a lot. At this point, let me just say to those of you who are watching that if you have uh, any desire to interact with 
what we've said. Uh, there's an email address below. You can write to me and we'll be happy to engage you in some way, shape, or form. And with that, Don, I want to thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.